excited to see so many uh, people here today, hungry people, but now satisfied people. Um, I'm going to speak for about six or seven minutes to lay out a uh, sort of history of how we got here. And then we're going to turn to this really excellent panel that we have for some of the perspectives on what's happening in the Congress this year. Um, as, uh, as Danielle just mentioned, uh, my own work in this area happened a lot when I was in the Clinton administration. Uh, in 1999, at the end of the year, John Podesta, the chief of staff, asked me to chair a 14-agency White House working group on how to update our electronic surveillance laws for the internet. So we had, you know, what are called over three-letter agencies in the world, like the CIA and the FBI, the DIA and the NSA, and Justice and all. And also trying to figure out how do you uh, update the authorities to take uh, uh, rec recognition of new technology. See, in a lot of ways, the law was written where we wrote laws a while back for the telephone era. And then it would say things like, uh, when you attach a device to something, then you could get a wiretap. But if you attach software, maybe that wasn't covered. And so there were lots of problems in the language of the law that were basically telephone era law that didn't make sense for the internet age, that didn't make sense for a cell phone age, didn't make sense for new technology. And from recognition of that, um, in the summer of 2000, uh, the administration came forward with a legislative package to update a whole set of authorities for law enforcement. And also at the same time in our package, we updated privacy protections that were certain kinds of risks to personal privacy that hadn't existed before. That went into uh, a serious consideration in the House Judiciary Committee in the fall of 2000. And um, just to give you a sense of the politics here, just to describe it, how it's flipped and how it's a little bit funny in this area, um, the Democratic bill got attacked viciously by House Republicans as being too privacy invasive. That the, 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 the consensus in the committee that year is we had to raise privacy protections um, in a number of areas. Um, and that the, the, um, the request from law enforcement for new powers were, were overreaching, were too far. And so a bill that emerged from House Judiciary that year, 28 to 1, in this direction of greater privacy protections than the Clinton administration had proposed. But it's fair to say that things changed very substantially politically and in many other ways with 9-11. And a week after 9-11, eight days after 9-11, the Bush administration introduced the bill that became the Patriot Act. Now that got discussed in Congress, um, uh, uh, not with long hearings, but with pretty intense discussions at staff and member level. Um, in the Senate, uh, there was uh, at that time Senator Leahy, chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. There was negotiations on certain points uh, where the administration changed its position. And in the House, uh, led by Dick Armey, who was the majority leader, there was a push to say that there needed to be a sunset, that it was too hard in October and November of 2001 to figure out what the right answer would be for all time. And instead, what happened, what emerged from the House was the idea that Congress would have to come back to the key issues a few years later. Originally it was two years and ended up being four years later. And those four years were almost up. So as of December 31st of this year, a bunch of the new authorities for the Department of Justice disappeared. They can still be used for the data gathered before December 31st for ongoing investigations. But if there's no legislation this year, the Department of Justice loses many of its new powers under the Patriot Act. I think it's fair to say that's given the Department of Justice a reason to seek legislation in this area that it wouldn't have um, if it had gotten permanent authorization back in 2001. So we're having very substantial debates this year on what to do in this area. I testified twice at House Judiciary. There's been a lot of hearings around the Hill, the Intelligence Judiciary Committee hearings. Maybe some of you have attended some of those. But there's a lot of issues in play on how to make permanent, or at least to lengthen the amount of time that these new authorities are in place. And then there's been a lot of debate, and we'll hear from the American Library Association and others, about how to update privacy protections, how to make sure checks and balances are in place uh, in this area. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce the panel in just a minute, but I'll, I'll highlight a couple of chunks of what's going on in this area, the big pieces. One big piece has to do with what's called foreign intelligence surveillance. Most of you, when you think of uh, the cops listening in on a wiretap, you think it's because of a crime, a crime's about to be committed, or we're trying to get an organized crime group uh, taken care of. But if there's a threat to the national security, Congress wrote a statute back in the late 1970s 
that creates a whole different set of rules for how surveillance happens inside the United States. And that's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Fight the Patriot Act changed that a lot. It said that foreign intelligence and law enforcement could be combined in various ways. It also changed the rules about what kind of data could be gathered. On my website, which is peterswire.net, there's a long article on the history of the foreign intelligence surveillance system. And you can read it if you want to. It's designed to let people understand from sort of A to Z of this area. Another big piece has to do with domestic law enforcement rules. How easy is it to get wiretaps of the phone numbers people have had? How easy is it to get information more generally for activities inside the United States? And in your, in your materials, in your handout, there's um, some descriptions of some of the different rules that apply to different kinds of wiretaps and searches. And I think those two things, law enforcement surveillance and FISA surveillance, are the biggest discussions we're going to have today. I think those are the areas where there's been the most sort of infighting about different issues. There's many other issues in Title II of the Patriot Act. Title II is the electronic surveillance part, some of which we won't get to today. There's also other parts of the Patriot Act. There's immigration provisions and other things. But the sunset is about the law enforcement and FISA authorities, especially those authorities, for wiretapping with what kind of checks and balances and safeguards. And I think that's the focus for the debate. Um, there, uh, the Senate Intelligence C uh, Committee has passed out uh, a proposal to expand the power of the uh, uh, FBI to get information without going to a judge, what are called administrative subpoenas. That's been passed. House and Senate Judiciary are working towards bills. House Intelligence is likely to have something. And this year, oh good, we have our whole panel. Uh, this year, um, uh, these are some of the topics that will be played out. I'm going to uh, uh, give brief introductions about each of our four speakers. Um, I think the question is whether the Assistant Attorney General would like to go first or not. Ms. Michelle, would you like to go first, or, or do you want a minute to soak up the atmosphere? And... Let's do a little soaking. Okay. <laughs> That's just come from another another event. It, um, it, in that case, I'm not sure whether to, where to, our order, just because of who's arrived when, is a little bit... Um, less clear. Usually I'd like to have the government go first and do the affirmative case. So I might ask Mr. Rowan to, to be our first speaker. What? That's fine. Okay. Um, uh, Patrick Rowan, and I'm going to introduce all four, and then we're going to have about three to five minutes from each person, and then I hope a lot of time for questions and comments back and forth. Uh, Patrick Rowan is now in the criminal division of the U.S. Department of Justice. He's been uh, a, a longtime prosecutor with a lot of experience in real life criminal cases worked in the Office of General Counsel in the FBI during the time after 9-11, got to see that perspective. Uh, and so now is in the Justice Department uh, uh, working on what the criminal law needs to be like uh, to be effective. Um, our second uh, speaker will be uh, Emily uh, Chekatov, who's the Associate Executive Director of the American Library Association. And you may know that libraries have been sort of a, a sort of focal place for where the debate has happened and whether surveillance should happen, whether free speech is being affected, et cetera. Um, she has extensive experience in the U.S. government and the executive branch in a lot of places, um, has, uh, has worked um, uh, with Congress, the executive branch, on library issues for a number of years, um, and will be speaking from that perspective. And then I think we'll then go third to uh, William Michella, who is the uh, Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice for Legislation. Um, and in that role has the lead role for being liaison with the Hill uh, for the department and has the distinguished pedigree to, 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 to match with that. And our fourth speaker will be uh, Jim Dempsey of the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, Jim has been uh, immersed up to his eyeballs and beyond in Patriot Act this year. Uh, how many times have you testified, Jim, on these issues this year? Six. Six, six testimonies in Congress this year. So um, Jim will, uh, will, will comment from the perspective of uh, the Center for Democracy and Technology, a, a sort of civil liberties uh, group that works carefully with industry and the government on a lot of topics. So with all that, I'm going to ask Patrick Rowan to go first. Uh, and uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, I thought it would be a little bit useful to take a, a half step back and provide some context to you for the discussions concerning the Patriot Act from the perspective of law enforcement, the Department of Justice and the FBI. Um, on any given day, the FBI and its law enforcement partners on uh, joint terrorism task forces and other federal law enforcement agencies 
are running down hundreds of leads related to terrorism and espionage. Um, in the busier field offices, there might be that many being actively worked at one time. Um, so when we are discussing a provision of the Patriot Act and the abstract, I think my point, what I'd like to convey to you today is we need to keep in mind how that affects all those investigations going on out there in the country. Um, there's going to be offices that are working on high gear in multiple cases in this area. And there's obviously great urgency associated with this it's a terrorism case. That means it's a potential threat to our national security. And so the FBI and other agencies are going to try to run down every lead, run down every tip, and try to determine, first of all, is this something we should be spending our time on as an investigative matter, or can we quickly wash this out as being nothing? And, and more importantly, if it is something that we need to be looking at, what's the threat here? Who is this person? Who is this person working with? What might they be doing? Um, and we need to do that as quickly as possible because in some instances, what we might be working on is watching somebody who would be the next Rusala, somebody who is actively engaged in an operation, who is about to do something that we don't expect, and all of a sudden we've gone from from surveilling a person as they go through their activities to trying to prevent a terrorist event. Um, so, well, the provisions of the Patriot Act we look at as being tools, tools to get to the bottom of these investigations. And in some instances, they might be tools we use very frequently, like <coughs> pen registers or wiretaps. And others, they might be tools we use rather less frequently, like, for example, the uh, Section 215 records provision. But they're all there, and they're available because we've determined at one point or another that this is going to be a useful tool to quickly get to the information that we need in order to determine, is this a threat, and if so, how serious is it, and what do we need to do to stop it? And keep in mind, too, that to the extent we're working in the area of international terrorism or espionage, we have a need to conduct these investigations in secret because the person that we're targeting um, could either flee or even more of a concern in the terrorism area, speed up their plan to do something against us. Keep in mind also that in many instances, we're working off very limited information. There may be a lead that comes in from a foreign intelligence service that names an individual that doesn't tell us exactly what he's up to, suggests that he has an association with the group. And we don't have the ability to write then and there an affidavit establishing probable cause that this person is a member of Al-Qaeda and about to conduct the plot. We're trying to determine exactly who he is and what it's about and whether or not that tip we got is of any validity. So the, 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 the tweaks that some have suggested in the context of the Patriot Act, um, while it may not seem on paper in the abstract to be significant, what I want to make sure everybody is clear about is the extent to which um, those tweaks, when they raise the bar for what kind of evidence we need, or otherwise slow down an investigation, may affect the way we go about business on a day-to-day -day basis in hundreds of cases. Now, obviously, the fact that we want to get to the bottom of this stuff quickly doesn't mean that we don't have to subject ourselves to supervision and oversight. Um, you know, whether that supervision comes internally, in the FBI we're talking about you know, the, the fact that the supervisor, a special agent in charge, or a headquarters official has to approve the use of the technique. It may come from federal lawyers, like the lawyers at the Office of uh, Intelligence Policy and Review. Those are the attorneys for the federal government. DOJ who are involved in obtaining FISA wiretaps. You know, the supervision and oversight may come from the courts. In fact, the, some of the hot button provisions that I expect we'll discuss today, delayed notice search warrants, uh, orders under Section 215 for business records, roving wiretaps, all of those are provisions that require us to go to a federal judge and get his permission or her permission to use the tool. And then, of course, the other element of oversight is congressional oversight. There's reporting requirements in the Patriot Act. That kind of thing. So in all those instances, when we 
complete the Patriot Act, we need to keep in mind that we may be rendering a tool a lot less useful, and in some instances, useless to our cases. Now, I'm happy to explain how that works in practice. I'll give you a quick example in the area of Section 215 orders, which are for business records. The standard now is that the uh, information we seek has to be relevant to an investigation of terrorism or foreign intelligence, counterintelligence. <laughs> If we raise that standard and say that you can't get an order unless you have specific and articulable facts giving reason to believe that the person to whom the records pertain is an agent of a foreign power, which is one of the suggestions that's floating around, then we have decreased the usefulness of that because there's going to be a lot of circumstances where we see someone who we believe is a terrorist or believe is a spy, and we see him meet with another person, and that second individual is in a rental car. Well, we'd like to go get the records of that rental car to find out who this person is, because that's obviously very basic to an investigation. We want to know who they're associating with and what we can find out about them from who they're associating with. Well, we may not be able to meet that standard if all we do is see them meet with a terrorist or meet with a spot. So if, if we have a lower standard, we can go to the court using the Section 215 and perhaps get those records from a, 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 use, a, from a, a rental car company. But if the standard's higher, that's going to prevent us from doing it. So we have to go another route. We have to surveil them longer. We have to watch more. We have to do this. We have to do that. And every time we do that, we're going to trade off because there's another case we can't work as hard. And so that, that's my pitch for keeping in mind, as, as you think about these things, what the bottom line is for us tomorrow. Thank you. I'm with the American Library Association, and we have been involved in this issue since September 11th. Um, we're very concerned about this. ALA and the Gates Foundation have just completed a study showing that public libraries still provide the only internet access for the nation's poorest areas. 98.9% .9 of public libraries offer free public internet access. This means that people living on fixed or low incomes can rely on public library computers at a much higher rate than they do than the more wealthy. We know that African Americans and Hispanic Americans are nearly twice as reliant as whites and Asians on library computers, and Native Americans are three <coughs> times more likely to rely on library computers. This is why this issue is so important to us, because so many people in this country feel they have nowhere else to turn, turn to the public library. And we want to make sure that nothing stops them from doing that. We need to make sure that the library continues to be the place that people get equity of access, that no matter who you are in this country, you can work on a level playing field. And so the American Library Association conducted a survey which has just been completed, the first comprehensive nationwide survey measure, measuring law enforcement activity in public and academic libraries and the impact that the knowledge of the Patriot Act has had on patrons and the activity that they pursue in those libraries. Although the analysis is not yet complete, we know that of the 500 public libraries responding to the survey, 125 reported law enforcement activity of at least one visit. Of the 921 academic libraries responding, 143 reported law enforcement activity of at least one visit. And each visit could be asking for one person's record, 20 people's records, 10,000 people's records. We don't know. In public libraries, 40% of the respondents indicated that the public had questioned library policies since the Patriot Act and what impact those policies and the law had on the delivery of library services. What this means is that the public knew enough that the Patriot Act changed their right to privacy and that concerned them. We don't know if it concerned them enough to make them not take a certain book out, not look at a certain website, not decide to read something, not decide to pursue some intellectual endeavor that was their right to do. At our just completed annual conference, librarians expressed a continuing confusion about their responsibilities under the Patriot Act. 
Libraries have established policies for working with law enforcement and a long history of cooperation with law enforcement. But this legislation, with its gag order and the fear of intimidation that it has caused, has rendered much confusion within library staff and a great deal of anxiety in the public. In, in an editorial in the New York Times, June 21st, the Times said that our survey showed that the American public's concern about library privacy is well-founded. The reason that the public's concern about privacy is so important is because it has a chilling effect on their ability to pursue what has always been their constitutional right. And this is why we feel that this is so important. We believe that the SAFE Act, which is being discussed in both the House and the Senate, would effectively address these concerns and allow the public to go back to using libraries with the confidence they should have. And if any of you would like any more information on any of the studies I quoted, they're on our website, <coughs> www.ala.org backslash OITP. Thank you, William and Michelle. Great, right, thank you. Um, it's a pretty good turnout for the day before uh, you're going to get out of town. Uh, hopefully, maybe for the panel, maybe for lunch, I'm not sure. But thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, before I uh, became Assistant Attorney General for Legislative Affairs, I spent 13 years uh, up here uh, working for uh, uh, various committees and one member. So I know how busy. Uh, your schedules are and your member schedules are, so I really appreciate uh, your coming uh, uh, to this lunch today. Um, the Justice Department has, no one I, I don't think has matched Jim's um, uh, staying power with regard to testifying. Um, I think we may have had one witness who testified three, maybe four times. I testified once. We attended 18 hearings um, in the House and the Senate, provided 32 witnesses and responded to hundreds of pages of um, uh, public information and uh, a lot of classified information to requests in the House Judiciary Committees, uh, the House and Senate Judiciary Committees, and the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. Um, uh, I think we're at the uh, end of the beginning, that is to say, um, the hearing process, I believe, is over unless one of those committees brings another hearing on me. Um, uh, and uh, we heard that uh, uh, the president has called for that the Patriot Act will be uh, reauthorized in full. The Attorney General uh, testified three times on the Patriot Act. Um, and when he testified, one thing he asked for was that there be um, uh, a fair uh, and honest debate. Uh, and we think that when you and your bosses, members of the public, demand the facts um, and understand what the Patriot Act does, um, that you will understand the Patriot Act um, was not uh, a revolutionary uh, piece of legislation, um, but that it was really a common sense uh, improvements to both the criminal law and the tools that uh, we use track spies and terrorists that uh, we need to engage uh, uh, the enemy, particularly Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups uh, on a daily basis. The one thing that the Patriot Act did, which was revolutionary, and that's, there is one thing, uh, is took down the so-called <clears throat> wall between uh, <coughs> intelligence and uh, criminal investigators. Prior to the Patriot Act, and one of our witnesses, although he didn't testify, but actually he did testify in this round, but he testified uh, a year ago, uh, the U.S. Attorney from Chicago, Pat Fitzgerald, uh, who was the U.S. Attorney, uh, or the, the Assistant U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York, and he prosecuted uh, several um, pre-Patriot Act um, terrorism cases, including um, the uh, embassy uh, bombings, uh, in Africa. And he told this story to the Senate Judiciary Committee. He basically said, look, we were conducting a criminal investigation, and he was able to talk to uh, his prosecutors, of course, the FBI criminal investigators, 
Al Qaeda, foreign uh, intelligence officials. There's one group they couldn't talk to and get information from, and those who were the FBI experts across the hall who were working UBL, Osama bin Laden. Um, that was because the wall that had been built up over the years, uh, which separated uh, law enforcement and intelligence officials. Section 218 of the Patriot Act, um, together with the decision by the FISA Court of Review, tore down that wall. And now prosecutors and intelligence are able to share information. There are other provisions of the Patriot Act which allowed uh, that sharing. Um, I want to mention, uh, I know on the invite there was uh, a mention of the late notice search warrant, so I'll touch on that. Um, briefly, and maybe the library issue very briefly, and then I think it's useful to get to Q&A because that's answering your questions are important. Um, one uh, issue that has come up um, that we've seen advertisements on, particularly during the political season, was the so-called delayed, what we call delayed notice search warrants. Others pejoratively refer to them as sneak and peek search warrants. Um, the ads that ran last year said that federal investigators could enter your home without telling you. I'm paraphrasing. That was basically it. Um, without ever telling you. Um, I am heartened that the debate has changed. Uh, there was an advertisement that I saw that ran in Roll Call just the other day, um, which actually uh, from those who have concerns about the late notice search warrants, but they were actually a lot more accurate than they were um, uh, in the past. And I think there has been um, uh, recently a more honest and open debate. What is a delayed notice search warrant? Um, prior to the Patriot Act, the uh, federal prosecutors could apply to a federal court judge and when executing a search warrant, just like you see on Law and Order, knock, 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 hand you the subpoena, um, or pardon me, the search warrant, court order, um, uh, uh, notice is given at that time, assuming someone is actually at the uh, residence or business. And what did we have to show to the federal judge prior to the Patriot Act? We had to meet the Fourth Amendment standard, which is probable cause. Um, uh, all the Patriot Act, and all the Patriot Act did for that was codify that common law practice that had existed for many, many years prior to the Patriot Act. We did have one, what the Patriot Act did was it resolved uh, some differences between the circuits. Every circuit that had uh, addressed this issue had, had ruled that it was constitutional. Every circuit allowed the delayed notice search warrants, but this made one consistent standard uh, across the board. Um, so we go to a federal judge, um, uh, show probable cause, and show uh, good reasons why uh, the delay would uh, be harmful to the in investigation. I'll give you an example for those of you who have uh, drug problems. This is one, one of those uh, issues where critics say, well, you know, that Patriot Act was about terrorism. Well, the Patriot Act certainly was geared uh, in response to 9-11. But a lot of criminal tools are used, um, as well as uh, intelligence-related tools, are used in response to uh, uh, terrorist um, uh, activity. There was an operation out of Buffalo, actually it was almost the entire East Coast, but uh, we had a major organized crime and drug enforcement task force operation called Candy Box. Um, there was a major cross-border organization between Canada and the U.S. that were moving uh, major uh, uh, amounts of ecstasy. It was the largest ecstasy ring uh, in North America. Um, to make a long story short, we knew that a mule was crossing the border, a mule was the person carrying the drugs. So, uh, we obtained a regular search warrant from a federal judge after establishing probable cause. We went to a rest stop, went to eat. The DEA executed that warrant <coughs> by um, entering the car uh, and seizing the car, 
and spring and we took it see and sprinkled glass on the ground to make it look like it was stolen. Um, three and a half weeks later, uh, he was notified along with 130 of his Confederates uh, that we had taken his car. He was arrested, as were about 129 other people. Um, as the investigation unfolded, uh, we ended up arresting, I think the last number that I saw was 212 individuals, seized over $9 million in currency, jewelry, uh, 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 a lot of methamphetamine, ecstasy. Um, this wound up um, uh, crippling the, uh, this ecstasy ring, which was responsible for 20% of all the X that was brought into the country. Um, in the car, in a hidden compartment, were 30,000 MDMA tablets, ecstasy, and 10 pounds of a high potency, hydroponically grown uh, marijuana. So the reason for the delay was that we didn't jeopardize that investigation. The prosecutor is in a, has a Hobson's choice. Do I let the drugs walk? And, and don't jeopardize the investigation, or seize the drugs so that it doesn't go on the streets and you know ecstasy is going right to college and high school kids, um, uh, uh, or uh, you know, it's a risk um, the drugs going to the street or tipping, that, tipping off the organization. So this is a, uh, an important tool which we are seeking, not subject to the sunset. One of the reasons why is that the Congress, when it established sunset, said, look, we're gonna it sunsets on 16 provisions, those that we deem are new, and I was chief house negotiator of Patriot at the time, so I was, I'm very familiar with uh, all the discussions uh, that took place then, and uh, it, it's a critical tool that we're seeking to uh, keep intact. Uh, I won't address libraries, but I think we'll do that actually. Jim Dempsey, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Peter, thanks for the uh, introduction. To the uh, Vice Committee of the Union Caucus for sponsoring this. Uh, I think there are a couple of uh, points to recognize here. Um, there are about 150 provisions in the Patriot Act, uh, 16 of them sunset. Of the 16 that sunset, uh, depending upon how you count and how strict you are, at least uh, seven are non controversial. They're just not the subject of any debate. The other nine, to a greater or lesser degree, are controversial. Now, and, and as um, Will noted, some of the more controversial provisions, like the sneaky peak, peak provision, are not subject to the sunset. But even there, there is a handful of uh, maybe four uh, non-setting provisions that are uh, controversial. Uh, sneaking peak provision, the uh, use of so-called national security letters, um, provision defining uh, domestic terrorism in an overbroad way. But of all of the provisions, sunsetting or non-sunsetting, not a single one is going to sunset at the end of this year, period. The debate is not over whether any of these tools, as Patrick Rowan referred to them, and they are tools, not a single one of these tools will be lost by the government. There's not a single category of records that are off limit to the government. I think even the American Library Association will say <coughs> that in certain cases, library records can be obtained by the government. The debate now, finally, is over what it should have been over in 2001, and that is the standards, the checks and balances, <coughs> the criteria for using these powers which in a democratic society is what we always uh, worry about. There's not a very, very few powers we deny the government, absolutely. But it's a question of the standards. Now, the Patriot Act was put forward uh, about a week after uh, the 9-11 uh, attacks. 
uh, clearly you cannot come up, this was before really we had fully analyzed what had happened. It wasn't until over a year after that the 9-11 uh, Senate joint hearings began. Two or three years after that, the 9-11 Commission reported, only uh, earlier this year, the WMC Commission reported in terms of what was wrong with our system. So the Patriot Act was adopted before we even knew what was wrong. Uh, and since then, uh, people have repeatedly found, and I think all of those uh, studies found, that there was very little in the legal authorities available for the government that was linked to 9-11 happening. And that there is very little in the Patriot Act that you can point to and say, if we had had this power, we would have prevented 9-11. In fact, the one, strictly speaking, 9-11 uh, fix, the so-called Sowie fix, isn't in the Patriot Act at all. The lone wolf provision was in the uh, Intel authorization legislation of last year. Now, but the, again, these are, at core, each of these issues has a legitimate um, function. And in terms of the wall, the wall is down, legally speaking, although just yesterday, the president made further executive orders trying to get the wall down as a practical matter. The wall, as a practical matter, was always higher and stronger than it was as a legal matter. But as a legal matter, the wall is down and nobody's proposing re-erecting it. Sharing of information between intelligence and law enforcement agencies, and between law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies, and between the uh, investigators and the intelligence agents of the FBI is fully permitted, legally. What we're talking about are some of these investigative standards, and as Peter said, they fall roughly into two categories. The Foreign Intelligence Act, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act changes, and the uh, changes to underlying criminal law. The changes to the criminal law, as others have alluded to, are not uh, directly responsive to terrorism. These are changes that were made across the board. In fact, when the Justice Department came forward after 9-11 and asked, as it had repeatedly, for a uh, sneak and peek provision which had been rejected by Congress and by administrations and Congresses prior to 9-11, when the um, Justice Department came forward once again and put forward its sneak and peek provision, one of the proposals was, okay, we have a real crisis here, clearly. Terrorism is a genuine threat. Let's limit this to terrorism cases. Sounds like reasonable. Justice Department said, uh-uh. We want this for every single federal crime in the books. We want this for student loan cases. We want this for uh, every tax evasion cases. And they got it. Um, and they said, and they say now, that they were codifying the law. Well, in fact, only two circuits had, uh, of 11, how many circuits are there now? More than, more than when I graduated from law school. Um, but uh, two or three of the 11 or 12 circuits had a uh, rule on sneak peeks. They had done so actually before the Supreme Court ruled, as it did in a, an opinion by Justice Thomas, that the notice is actually part of the constitutional um, Fourth Amendment inquiry. So I've always thought, and I think the Justice Department in its heart of hearts thinks that sneak and peek searches are on shaky constitutional ground and that those three um, court decisions are on shaky constitutional ground, which is why I um, think they pushed so hard for codification, trying to boost legislatively what they were uh, to some extent had in courts. But the interesting thing is, the courts had said, as a general rule, we will give these sneak and peek delayed notice searches for seven days. Get in there, get the drugs, get the evidence, search warrant after all comes sort of late in the investigation normally is one of the last of the building blocks of the investigation. Seven days, come back to us if you need more time, we'll give you seven more days or whatever. The sneak and peek provision in the Patriot Act has no time limit. Now the single judge, by the way, has denied a single sneak and peek request by the government since the legislation was enacted. The vast majority of them have been in non-terrorism cases, the vast majority have been in drug cases. 
I think probably it's fair to say the vast majority of search warrants by the Justice Department are drug cases. But every judge has approved every request. Six or seven judges have approved indefinite requests. And we went from seven days as the rule which we were codifying to the Justice Department to unlimited delay of notice. One court, the one notice that went on, went on for 400 plus days. Now, I don't think that when your bosses were talking about emergencies, observing the integrity of investigation, and making sure that witnesses didn't flee, that they thought that they were voting for a 400 plus or unlimited delay. So the critics of the Patriot Act had come forward and said, let's put a time limit on this. Let's start with seven days or 14 days. Let's put a limit in there. You can always come back to the judge and say, I need additional time. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the checks and balances and the role of the judges. And that's where the locus of the debate is. Somewhere between seven days and unlimited. Not losing this tool, not crippling uh, the ability of the Justice Department to carry out its responsibilities. Section 215, the so-called business records or library records. Let's, let's hold on that because we're going to I'm going to come to Good. that in question, sort of moderated part. Good. Um, the, the, the format I was asked to follow and what the caucus, uh, the Internet Caucus does, <coughs> have relatively brief opening statements. I'm now going to come back to a couple of the key issues and get different people on the same issues so we can clarify those. And then we'll have, I think, the better part of half an hour for discussion and questions from the Um We were just on delayed notice, but let's stick there for a minute. Um, so we. We've heard Jim describe uh, the pre-9-11 circuit court decisions uh, in a certain way, and we've also heard uh, Attorney, Assistant Attorney General Michelle describe uh, codification of pre-existing law. Uh, I'd like to go back to the Department of Justice, perhaps, and perhaps you have some comment back to what Jim's saying um, on, on how to think about um, longer, shorter, is it codification of what the practice was before, or is this an expansion? How do we, how do we think about that? Well, the, the circuits were split. Um, it's not accurate to say that it was seven days all around the country. It's accurate to say that in the Ninth Circuit, um, the Ninth Circuit had decided that seven days was presumptively reasonable. Um, uh, there was a presumption built in the Ninth Circuit's opinion. The Fourth Circuit and the Second Circuit, which had also ruled on this issue, had a little bit uh, different standards. I, um, my recollection is that the Fourth Circuit uh, did not have any time limit and had a reasonableness test. Um, with, I thought the Second Circuit was sort of around seven days. I'd have to double check the Second Circuit. But so you had so my point is that there were different standards throughout the nation, um, and so this merely codified the existing practice. Well, and no, it didn't codify because it says there is no time limit, or you set your own time limit. But to me, a codification means. You pick a standard and you say, everybody follow this standard. It said the law says, make up a standard as you go along. That to me is not codification. No, it says that um, what you've been uh, and others have said, we want a judge involved, and the judge is in the best position to decide whether a particular, <clears throat> a particular investigation warrants a seven day delay in the notice, uh, a 30 day delay, or, or whatever that is. In, in fact, in this particular um, uh, tool, it's chock full of oversight because not only do we have to go to the judge on the front end, um, in uh, most of the instances that we have found, because we did, Jim threw out some numbers, uh, we did a survey of the field, and he's, he's uh, uh, referring to some of those. One in 500 search warrants is a delayed notice search warrant. So uh, less than, uh, uh, that's two-tenths of one percent. Um, it's a two, and we go to a judge first, the judge has oversight over it, and then when we bring a criminal case eventually, if there's a challenge uh, to what we did, uh, the defendant will have a motion to suppress a trial. Uh, this is one of these, this is a tool where, where um, uh, it has more checks, it, it, it has all the checks that uh, Jim and others have been asking for. Okay. 
Um, if, it's such, if, if it's just a codification of the law, and if we're going to let the judges decide, then let it sunset and go back to where the judges were before this one. Because if they were doing it right before, then let it sunset. Let me let just, what's the legal effect of the bill passed by the House about delayed notice, and how is that going to change the debate this year, in, in your view? So anybody, what, the House passed a provision on connected appropriation, did it didn't pass? What, I thought that, it was was a, that was a Sanders amendment to the Justice Department appropriation, and that said that no appropriated funds could be used to enforce Section 215 looking at reading records in libraries or bookstore records, uh, but it did not have to do with electronic records, just the reading records. Okay, the House passed something on delayed notice in the previous year, but that was, I think, some different. Okay, um, so on delayed notice, that I think the hope is we have an understanding that there's, there's, there's this battle about length of time. Is there anything other major issue on delayed notice besides length of time that people are arguing about this year? Well, one of the issues is, again, a little bit going to this codification point, which is what are the kinds of circumstances in which notice should be delayed? And uh, I think there are some on which there's a widespread agreement um, if it would uh, endanger somebody, a, a witness, an informant, or uh, endanger law enforcement officers, <coughs> cover, whatever. If it would, uh, or if there's a pending crisis, if it would result in the destruction of evidence or result in flight from prosecution, uh, result in intimidation of witnesses, those are all legitimate justifications. But again, Congress didn't quite think this through. Instead, it referenced for sneak and peek searches another set of adverse consequences which were developed for access to stored email and just said, well, we'll take those wholesale without really looking at whether they uh, match the cases or anything for going into homes and uh, offices. And there's a catch-all provision that says you can get a sneak and peek search if, there's, if the judge finds that there's uh, reason to believe that it might, um, it's sort of a low standard, not the probable cause standard, but the underlying warrant, reason to believe that it may um, jeopardize the investigation or unduly delay the trial. And I really don't understand what the unduly delay the trial is. Um, but there is concern that this catch-all provision is too broad. Sure. Um, the, um, it's seriously jeopardized or unduly delay. We don't believe it to be a catch-all. Um, the provision um, uh, to jeopardize means to imperil is to greatly endanger the investigation and, and the materials that we provide to Congress. The situation that comes up um, most of the time in these cases is jeopardy to an ongoing uh, wiretap. There was a case out of the Western District of Pennsylvania in which um, another OCDEF, a drug case, um, was investigating a major heroin ring in Western Pennsylvania. Um, there was a court-approved wiretap in that case, and investigators learned that uh, there was some of the players in the heroin ring were also involved in a major credit card fraud. Well, uh, and, and learned that a FedEx package, fraudulent credit cards, and other materials was being sent. Um, investigators went to the judge, established probable cause based on the wire, got permission to delay the notice, intercepted the credit cards, and took down, eventually took down both rings. Again, the dilemma here is that the um, uh, let the contraband walk uh, or tip off uh, that major uh, that major group. The DEA reported to us that the number of heroin deaths in Allegheny County uh, decreased from I think the numbers were 146 in 2000. And two, uh, don't quote me here because these numbers are in the materials we sent to the committee to 46 in 2000 through 2004. So they went down um, about 100 deaths in one and a half years. This is a provision that saves lives, it's critically important, and we believe that, that it has a, a federal judge, not the executive branch, not the prosecutor, and that's the real prosecutor at this table, but that the federal judge is in the best case, but best position 
to determine whether or not our request is a reasonable one. But let's turn to Session 215, uh, one of the other hottest issues this year, the records searches related to FISA searches. Uh, Patrick Rowan, uh, I'll try to get this accurate and correct me, made a point that today the law is it should be relevant to an ongoing uh, foreign intelligence investigation. And there's proposals, including the SAFE Act, to ramp that requirement up to there needs to be specific and articulable facts that the individual whose records are being accessed is an agent of a foreign power. Right. Okay, so that's, a, that's relevant to an investigation, which means anything that's relevant, lower standard, up to very specific facts that this person is an agent of foreign power. And Patrick made a point about how uh, this is going to slow down finding the associates of somebody you're following. It might imperil uh, very much an ongoing investigation. So with that as a sort of explanation for the current version of 215, maybe have either Emily or Jim explain critiques or reasons why you've supported the stricter version that maybe would get in the way of the investigation. Well, 48 states in the District of Columbia have confidentiality laws for library records. There is a higher level of privacy accorded library records than car rental records, hotel records, what kind of refrigerator you buy. Two states that don't have um, a state law have a prevailing attorney general's opinion. And the reason they have that, the reason library records are treated differently than car rental records, is that judges recognize the relationship to the First Amendment. That to have free speech in this country, you must have the freedom to go about your intellectual pursuits. That there is no link between the book that you read and the action that you are going to take. So that's why we have been pushing to raise the criteria for the Patriot Act that no longer allow the Patriot Act to preempt these state laws, but raise, raise the criteria back up to a reason to believe, to some articulable fact, some relationship between the individual, so that libraries do not become the fishing expeditions of the federal government. And the reason that this has become so controversial, we believe, is that everybody understands, the public understands, you don't have to be a lawyer to know that you don't want the federal government snooping in your reading records. And this is why this has resonated so much with the public. This is why there are 380 communities that have passed anti-Patriot Act resolutions. So let's get the public back behind a lot of what the Justice Department is trying to do. Let's eliminate this. Let's raise the standard back up and allow there to be some criteria so that reading records are no longer uh, able to be a fishing expedition. And let's have some transparency in the reports that the Justice Department makes to Congress. Now, all their reports about what they're doing in libraries are made in secret. We have no idea what the Justice Department is doing, which is why we did the survey that we did. Let's have the Justice Department report aggregate facts. They don't have to report specifics about the investigation, but what kind of materials are they asking for from libraries, and how many times are they going to libraries? If they make these reports in a public way, then terrorists are not going to know, well, they're going to the Cleveland Public Library and looking at email. If you make ag aggregate reports without specifying any geographic location, you can keep doing your investigations without the fear that anything will be discovered. Peter, what, before, I, I'm going to come back to you. I'm, I'd like to get on libraries from the Department of Justice and then the broader 215 have Jim. Uh, so on, on this library issue, what about a carve out for reading materials because of First Amendment concerns? Let me just make it clear one thing. By carve out for reading materials, um, you're talking about something like the standards. Let me just um, lay out to you one hypothetical, which is not too um, distant from the kind of things we encounter. If we were to obtain from a you hear, is he speaking to the mic enough? Maybe. Okay. If we were to obtain from a foreign intelligence service uh, some materials that they recovered from an Al Qaeda safe house, they said, look, their intelligence service. It's in the way our country works, we can't let everybody know that you that we're helping you in your fight against Al Qaeda because it's not a popular cause in our country. 
but nonetheless, here's some information. You can never use it in court, but here's what we got in the safe house. And it's a, it's a library book from the District of Columbia Public Library on the construction of the, of the DC Metro system. It would be um, the first and most logical step in that investigation to go to that library and try to obtain the record of who got that book out. And we can't use the grand jury tools if this uh, intelligence service has limited our use of the um, uh, uh, material. So we need to go in a way that we can do this in a classified setting, and that means the files, and that means the business record under Section 215. Now, we could meet the current standard, I think, relevant to a, a, a terrorism investigation. And, and I would argue that would be an entirely logical thing, to go to that library with that court order from a judge saying, produce to us the records of who it was that got this book out. Um, if we were to have a carve-out that says you can't do that, I don't, I don't quite understand what the purpose of that is. I mean, there's, there's obviously sensitivities associated with libraries that I think Will can tell you about the use or non-use of the provision with respect to libraries, but to me, that just is, is, a, is an entirely logical and reasonable step that we would want to be able to take using the current standard. I, I'm, one issue then is whether library records, reading materials, should be different from other business records. Jim's twice tried to make a point, I think, more broadly about business records and, and, the, and what standards appropriate. So, Jim, perhaps you could speak to that and then we'll hear the Justice yeah. Department on that point. No, thanks for uh, drilling down on this, uh, Peter, because uh, this gives us an opportunity to really spend a little bit of time on an individual issue, which is important. And uh, 215 clearly goes well beyond the uh, library records, it applies to any records of any entity, whether uh, for-profit or non-profit, and any tangible things that that entity might have. And the issues posed by 215 are also posed by uh, Section 214, which has to do with pen registers uh, under FICE. And by the way, this is really handy in terms of the sort of glossary here, so I'm not going to describe what a pen register is. It's in here. Um, it also concerns Section 505, the National Security Letter Provision, Section 358, which has to do with uh, access to financial records. And the, the, the issues are twofold. Does the government have to say to the judge, in the 215 context, what is the factual basis for its request? And secondly, does the government have to have some particularity, some specific focus on an individual or a group of individuals, or a book, or an account number, a telephone number? Does there have to be some particularity to its request? And where I depart, and by the way, I agree entirely here, and I depart from my, uh, some of my civil liberties colleagues on this, I agree with the Justice Department that the agent of a foreign power standard, which had been the standard for pen registers, for access to records, for national security letters, for access to financial records, the agent of a foreign power standard, for the reasons that Patrick Rowan explained, is too narrow. Because sometimes you're not interested in the suspected, a suspected terrorist is a suspected agent of a foreign power. Al-Qaeda is considered a foreign power. They're not a country, but they're a foreign power under the definitions of FISA, Hamas, Hezbollah, PFLP, PLO, um, uh, Islamic Jihad are all considered foreign powers for this discussion. And their members are considered agents of foreign powers. And their suspected members are covered by these laws. The, you're not necessarily looking for the suspected member of the terrorist group. You're looking for the guy who rented the car that he's driving in. You're looking for the person who rented the book. Or you're not sure if he's an agent of foreign power, although you found the book in a terrorist camp or whatever. But you're looking for somebody. As Patrick has said, you, the first thing you want to know when you see the, the known terrorist in the car with somebody else is, who's this other guy? Is he an agent of foreign power? You don't know that yet. You're trying to find out first who he is. Have we ever heard of him before? Is his name in our embassy somewhere? Does he come up somewhere else? You got a phone number that the terrorists call. You don't know whether he was calling a colleague or his mother. 
you want to find out who is this person. But you got somebody in mind. You got some particularity to it. The problem with 215 is it eliminated any requirement to say anything to the judge about why the records are needed, why they're relevant. And it eliminated, by its language, any need to have a particular person in mind. Now, I think that the Justice Department and the FBI do have, always, a specific person or a group of persons in mind. They may not know their name, in fact, that's what they may be trying to find out, but they have some specificity. What we're saying is, require that. Because as the law now stands, they don't have to go to the car rental company and say, we saw, give us the records of, of this particular car. They can go to the car rental company and say, give us your entire database for the last three years. It's relevant to a terrorism investigation. And they don't have to tell the judge when they get that order how it's relevant, why it's relevant. In all the cases that Patrick has mentioned, they would meet what I think is an appropriate standard. They've got some factual basis. Judge, we got a book, we seized it, or we seized in a terrorist camp. We think it, we can, it can help us find a terrorist and learn more about him. Oh, fine. Okay, now I know what you're doing. Go to that library and ask for that, the list of who took out that book. Not the list of who took out every book in the library. Okay, so well, let's ask for the last person, because if they possess well, the book. Well, maybe that too, right. Yeah, good point. Okay, so the, the, the main point I, I pulled from that is, you think there should be particularity in the finding that the judge makes and in, in the facts presented to the and judge? There should be some factual predicate stated <clears throat> by the government, and we're talking a very low, specific and articulable facts. We saw him sitting in a car with a terrorist. That's specific and it's articulable. That's all it takes. Okay, William Michelle. Um, just make a couple it, um, big picture points and, and uh, repeat some things the Attorney General has said in testimony. Um, first of all, um, if the state of um, things with regards to Section 215, or as uh, Emily described them, I would support DACA. We have no interest in the reading habits of uh, ordinary Americans. It is, and the Attorney General disclosed when he testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee that Section 215, as of May 30th uh, of this year, had never been used for bookseller, uh, library, gun sale records, or medical records. But we do have some facts, uh, and there's some things that we do know. Terrorists and spies have used public libraries. Um, Michael Regan, uh, a spy who was convicted several years ago, um, was uh, utilizing um, the facilities uh, of a public library. We disclosed last year that a, uh, 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 an Al-Qaeda member was using the facilities of a public library in a major metropolitan city in this country to communicate with his Confederates overseas. Um, and um, uh, we know on the criminal side that, uh, for example, Eric Rudolph actually, and we did um, uh, obtain uh, records relating to a book sale, Eric Rudolph had purchased, he was a, he was a domestic terrorist, had purchased a book Regard, uh, that had details about a particular detonation device. And uh, finding out who purchased that book was a key part of identifying Eric Rudolph as the Atlanta uh, Olympic uh, bomber. Um, so we, were, we would be 100% opposed to saying that libraries are somehow a safe haven, that the government- Nobody is asking. That. You keep no, throwing up Sanders, that smoke the, screen. The Sanders Amendment does do that. The Sanders Amendment, the Sanders Amendment says that on the intelligence side, or intelligence investigators using FISA cannot use that process. They can use it anywhere else. You just can't use it for a library, for a reading record, or um, a, a bookseller record. What, they, what you say is, well, but you can use grand jury process. Um, and Pat explained the reason why that might not necessarily be available. The Attorney General said a couple things. Um, well, with regard to that, I think the Sanders Amendment is a little bit the byproduct of the appropriations process where you have to say no funds may be used. 
So we had to come up with a no fund way to use. Well, funding limitations are often difficult things to, you have to get around Rule 21 and potential point of order, I understand that. Uh, the Attorney General said um, a couple of things with regard to Section 215. Um, we are certainly willing to uh, take a look at clarifying the law. And he announced three things that we'd be willing to do. The first was to make crystal clear that the standards is relevance. Because just like the word library, you do, it's true that you do not find the word relevance in the statute. Um, number two, um, we would make explicit, which we, we think is implicit, which is the ability to consult an attorney. Uh, and then the third thing is that the recipient of the 215 order would be able to file a motion to quash, just like in the grand jury process. Well, those details would be, we're working out and talking to the committees, but having the ability to quash, which means real process, go to the judge, and have the ability, uh, again, we're working those details out, but it would be um, with the federal court, um, and they would have that ability to do it, just like with a grand jury subpoena. Well, we have the ability to quash in a grand jury subpoena, and you saw evidence of that in Washington State. Um, but private citizens have no jurisdiction to go to the FISA court. An attorney can't see what the FISA court order says. I've already said we would have the ability to consult with an attorney, and or there to be a meaningful motion. This isn't currently in the statutory language, but the administration has said they support there's these positions. No proposal. I mean, there's the proposal. Well, we would support the ability for a library to attempt to quash this court order, but they're, you know, in what court could they go? They cannot go to the FISA court. If the FISA court is ordering, is putting out this, this court order, there's a gag order attached. How does somebody in Idaho go to a judge, but they have to fly to Washington and try and petition the FISA court. I think that that standard is, is unworkable. Well, as I said, it would be, uh, we support a meaningful motion to quash, and we are we are working with committees uh, right now, and they're okay. considering those things. But that's I'd like, I'm, I'm gonna open it up. We've, we've, we've drilled down a little bit on delayed notice, you can peek in on section 215. Are there other issues we haven't raised that people wanna make sure we get to today? My name is uh, Dave McCracken, and I'm president of the U.S. Bill of Rights Foundation. And there are just three points I'd like to make. And uh, I have been to many conferences like this, and I've listened to Mr. Comey and I've been broke up about the program. And there are three things that always bother me about these conferences when we listen to what the calls from the DOJ have to say. First of all, in listening to your anecdotal stories, which seem to be the same redundant story, can be seen as sort of ends means justification. I kept asking myself, as y'all both were telling each of your success stories, that you know we could eliminate all kinds of things and make the police far more efficient, make many more things and get many more things. But we chose not to. And we wrote this goal of rights and we had certain intentions. And we don't intend to let go. And so, you know, I, I'm all glad that you're catching these bad guys. And I'm not suggesting that we do away with all of it. But what I am saying is that, you know, anecdotal stories don't answer the question of, yes, but are you saying that the ends justify the means? The second thing that bothers me is that you always talk about going to the federal judge. Now, I know lots of judges are pointing to the Supreme Court and that they come from the federal system. But when they're sitting in the FISA court, they're sitting with a FISA cap room, and they're thinking, they're not thinking Article Three. they're thinking FISA rules. And we don't have the same access to that court as we do to Article Three. courts. FISA is not an Article Three court. It sits in secret. It, it, you can't challenge the defendant's attorney can't do that. And but y'all, it's, it's the admission is that you say, oh, we go to a federal judge, oh, we federal judge this, federal judge this, and I've even seen them interchange it. They'll talk about, when, you know, an Article Three judge in the same breath that they talk about a FISA judge. And the other one is this, this wall that y'all talk about. Turned out, from my understanding, to some degree, or greater degree, that, that that wall was a misinterpretation of the law, that they always had the ability to share the information back and forth, and it came out 
after 9-11, I mean, it might have taken 9-11 to bring it out, but it was more of a discovery than was a rule change. And those are the three things I wish you could address. Um, can I, I just, let me take on, into the light, I'm sorry. Um, the, the, the issue of the FISA judges, um, obviously they are our three judges, and I think the important thing about that is that they have lifetime tenure. If they decide they don't like what the government is asking them to sign, they can say no and not suffer any consequence from that. And I, I guess, I think, part of the reason you may have heard uh, people like myself and others from DOJ make the point that these are federal judges is, that uh, we all have the very real experience of having those judges, although they are sitting in the FISA court, uh, conduct their, their deliberations in the same way they would in, in their own courtrooms. In other words, that they don't rubber stamp, that they don't um, simply sign whatever's put in front of them, that there is back and forth. And, and I recognize that uh, and I think, unfortunately, it, it, the practical reality is we can't open that court up the way people might like us to because what we're doing there is, is relates to national security, relates to spies, and to terrorists who would dearly love to know who we're targeting. But I, I think, I don't think there's any sleight of hand going on there. I think these are the real thing who will tell us no, who will tell us you're overreaching, who will tell us go back and write that differently and maybe I'll consider it. And that's why, for us, it's a federal judge. Take it back, please. Yeah, and I'll just say my name is Sam. I work for a, conser a very conservative Republican who originally supported the Patriot Act. Not to suggest that he's not now, but I know that within the office and within a lot of other conservatives' offices, there's a lot of concern over certain aspects of the Patriot Act. So I'm say that <clears throat> I start by saying I'm, I'm fully aware of what's at stake and what it is you're doing. Warren Buffett has said that, you know, and he's one of the largest insurers in the world. Saying there'll probably be a nuclear blast go off in the United States within 50 years. But I would say that I, I have a lot of concerns about what's in the Patriot Act, namely because we now know that what resulted ultimately in the 9 11 attacks were absurd, you know, oversight um, and not actually these details. I don't know how book records would have somehow resulted in preventing the 9 11 attacks. Um, and beyond that, <clears throat> what about, I've heard that. Can I just, uh, let me just Please. address that real quickly. Um, you know, we've never had a dirty bomb go off in the country. And I can't tell you every way to prevent that. But to say that um, because a, a library record may not have been the thing that turned open the, uh, opened up the 9-11 commission, uh, the 9-11 uh, attacks, um, certainly is not a reason to take away uh, the ability for terrorism investigators to, to utilize that tool. And let me just say um, the other thing, then every commission that has been an 11 commission, WD commission, and the rest have all talked about a number of the provisions uh, in the Patriot Act, particularly the one taking down the wall. Jim has uh, addressed that. And that, that was um, uh, a very real impediment to the sharing of information. There could have been other things, technology, and the rest. Just to say that the Patriot Act has not helped uh, or nothing in there um, would have, I mean, I can't say from metaphysical certitude that anything in there would prevent 9-11, but it, it certainly, absolutely, positively helped afterwards. Look, two other things. One is that it bothers me that I've never heard the Justice Department say, we don't need this power. And I think a responsible agent of the government should be in the position of doing that. And the Justice Department is always willing to take more, but not necessarily to give back. And I think that ultimately that's a, what concerns a lot of people, which is that we, and that's why the sunset provision was put in there, because it's like, you will take whatever you're given and you'll use it, because that's your job. But ultimately there's a balance there that has to be considered. Going back, I think, to a little bit what he was saying about to what extent do the, do the, do the means justify the ends? I mean. Yes, we could make law enforcement a lot more easier, you know, if, you, if you're allowed to peek through blinds. The House, the court has said no, there has to be a reasonable ex expectation of privacy. So there are consequences are there. And then let me ask you this. I know that NSA has released recently that on several occasions they have disclosed that, um, or rather they have provided to the Justice Department or to the FBI the fact that um, communications that 
were between an American citizen who originated in the United States and were with a foreign entity. Now, under the NSA's charter, I don't believe they're allowed to do any electronic surveillance of American citizens. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. I have to say that uh, NSA is a complicated target yeah. uh, subject. I'm happy to talk with you about it afterwards, but I just don't think we, I mean, it would take us another but hour and a half. Have they, in fact, provided? They can appropriately and legally provide. I think what they're providing is sometimes mentions of U.S. persons in communications, both legs of which are overseas. They also can intercept communications, one of which legs in the United States if the interception occurs outside the United States. Mr. Michelle, how do you feel about the NSA's role in this mission? Uh, I don't know about the NSA piece, but if we need someone to come up and talk to your boss, I'd say call up the NSA. Let me instead, okay. Peter, if I could, make a couple points. We have 30 seconds. Yes. <laughs> We've heard a little bit today of the don't even tweak it because if you do, you will cripple our ability to fight terrorism theme, which to me has been one of the most disturbing themes in the, in the, in the, night, in the, in the sort of sunset debate. Don't change anything. Uh, John Podesta, former chief of staff, President Clinton, and Rich Falkenrath, former uh, deputy homeland security advisor to uh, George W. Bush, uh, pulled together a bipartisan working group of uh, eight former uh, Democratic uh, government, uh, both Hill and executive branch people, and eight former Republican uh, prosecutors and uh, Justice Department and White House counsel of the staff. And we agreed, the liberal, I was a part of it, the so-called liberals and the so-called conservatives agreed. The powers in the Patriot Act are good and useful and appropriate, but they can be amended to improve the checks and balances without crippling or adversely affecting their um, effectiveness. If you search on bipartisan working group, you'll find it, or it's at the cdt.org website, a, a, a unanimous bipartisan statement from that group, including people with far, far more experience than I have. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the uh, Department of Justice if you want a short concluding comment or you just plug life and liberty dot com so there you go. <laughs> sure, yeah, any website you want. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks to our very expert panel and for all of your attention.